And so there's a, a prophetic statement through the book of Isaiah, through the prophet Isaiah, from God saying, look, I'm God, I'm it, I'm the end all, be all, ultimate, quintessential ruler of the universe, I am the creator and father of it all, I hold it all together, I'm, I'm calling the end from the beginning, I'm telling you what's going to happen, I'm telling you from the ancient of times, here's my purposes, here's my plan, this is how it's going to go down, I'm calling it because I am uniquely positioned as the divine creator and lord of all, and my purposes, they will stand. And I will do all that I please, for I am the Lord. That's, I mean, that's the statement. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I'm restating. That's what God's saying. It, I, won't, I won't make us go to all these different scriptures. I'll quote a bunch just to give you kind of a, a smattering of, of the, these types of ideas that God says. But in the Old Testament, once again, Deuteronomy chapter 4, you don't have to go there. This is verse 39. Acknowledge, acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven and on the earth below. There is no other. Acknowledge and take to heart today that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, we won't go there either. There is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. 2 Kings verse 9, or chapter 19, verse 15. Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39. See now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me says the Lord. That's Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39. Basically, here's where we're at. God is unchallenged in his authority, in his position, in his divinity, in, in his, his placement as the supreme ruler and being an entity above all. His purposes are going to be fulfilled. His purposes are going to manifest. His purposes, that, that what's in his heart will come to fruition. What's in his, his mind, what he imagines, what he dreams of, what he purposes, it will come to pass Amen. merely by the very fact that he has spoken it and declared it. It will come to be. We'll do one more, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll actually, uh, actually, while I'm reading, why don't you guys go to Romans chapter 1, and I'll, I'll quote um, something out of Nehemiah. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. God made the heavens, even the highest heavens, all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the sea and all that is in them. You give, he gives life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship him. If we, could, if we could just have a, a glimpse of what we're dealing with, with God. Just, a, you know, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I'm telling you, I'm reading all these scriptures about God's sovereignty, about his power, about his purpose, about his singularity, about there is no other God besides him. I'm quoting all these Old Testament prophecies and proclamations and then these New, Te New Testament fulfillments in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm saying all this stuff. And then at the, the end of the day, the sum total of what it all boils down to and what it all means is God wants the heart of his people to be for him. He wants the heart of man. He wants his children to say yes and amen to his purposes. He wants the love of his children. He wants the love and heart of every single man, woman, and child on the earth. His purposes, he's got this ridiculous amount of power, this ridiculous amount of authority. He's got this ridiculous position as the supreme being. And his game plan is you. His game plan is love. His game plan is I want my 
my children to be in the kingdom of my kingdom. I want my children to be part of the family of God. I want my children, brothers and sisters, as part of the body of Christ to be as one man building the kingdom of God for his purposes. Like, he's got this awesome almost too good to be true gospel of Jesus Christ. If you were there last time I spoke, we talked about the word gospel and how when Paul and the other apostles started saying, look, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, they were using a word that was not frequently used. They were using a Greek word that was very infrequently used because it was such a strong, profound word that there was nothing, literally nothing was good enough to warrant the use of that word gospel. The word, it it literally means this news is so ridiculously, ludicrously good, there's really no purpose, there's no circumstance, there's no situation that warrants its use except for something like what God does through Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 1. We'll pick it up in verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen. Interesting. God's invisible qualities have been clearly seen. How do you see invisible qualities? Since the beginning of the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. That is the answer to the question. You'll hear this as a Christian. Well, what about the guy who's from Timbuktu and he doesn't know anything about the God or the Bible and he doesn't know anything about the Lord or Jesus. What about that guy who just never had the chance to hear about who God is and yada, yada, yada. And they have this whole like, super ridiculous scenario for the 21st century, which I'm, I'm not saying it never happens, but it's, it's pr- definitely not a commonplace scenario. And then they're like, what about that guy? How could you say, you know, God, God wants them to make a decision to receive him if, if, if they've never even heard of God? This scripture saying, look, if they looked up into the heavens, if they looked around them, if they looked at the sunset, if they looked at the colors, if they looked at, at all this awesome stuff that's in creation, in nature, part of God's design, if they looked at those things, they would be able to analyze them and look and say, this has some sort of purpose that's beyond just randomness or naturalism. There must be a creator, there must be a God, and he must have a purpose. And so they can cry out based off of just that revelation alone, and God will respond and send them what they need to, to be into a relationship with them. And I remember Pastor Chris told us a story. I mean, this was from, I'm guessing, late 80s, early 90s, so I mean, we're, we're at least a couple decades removed now, um, so maybe there was more untouched civilization than there is, than there is now. They were, I think, I think it was Thailand, and they went out in the middle of nowhere, Third world country, then plus the middle of nowhere on top of that. And they, you know, they had like this small like village, like settlement place. And miles off into the distance on this mountain, they could see this small sliver of smoke from a fire burning. And they're like, huh, what's that like way over there, like miles and miles away from here? And, you know, the guy, his host, was like, I don't know. You know, like, clearly somebody's over there. It's weird. There's, there's no settlements. There's no tribes or villages or peoples there. So I'm not sure what that's about. So the next day, they head over there. And, you know, they go up in the woods. They go into the mountain. They, they climb through all the different for, land formations. And they finally make their way to the, where that smoke was. And they find this 70-year-old guy who was like, jacked out of his mind, they said, like, he was rippling muscles, like, this ridiculous, like, specimen of a person, like, he's 70, but he's, like, way in better shape than, like, any of us, and, like, he didn't know English, he didn't know, you know, whatever, he didn't know how to communicate with them, so there was just, like, grunts and drawing stuff on the ground, and they were trying to communicate, and they were trying to, like, figure out each other and what, what the deal is, and basically what they ended up doing is through, like, drawing crosses and, look, you know, showing him the Bible and stuff, he's like, that's me, that's me, I, I'm, a, I'm Christian, like, he wasn't, wasn't actually using words, but something bad is happening with my microphone. <laughs> Anyways, um, 70-year-old ripped guy in the middle of nowhere knows Jesus, doesn't know English, doesn't have the internet, 
doesn't have anything as far as modern day communications and televisions and commodities like that. And yet this dude knows Christ Jesus. This dude knows who God is. And so that's the answer right there. That's the answer. I mean, God is good. God is faithful. God is able to win the day. See, who needs technology? Yeah, at some point, I will switch microphones, and that point is right now. Hello? That's embarrassing. So anyways, Romans chapter 1, God's invisible qualities. God's invisible qualities. They are clearly seen by what has been made. His, his eternal power, his divine nature, God's invisible qualities can be clearly seen by looking at creation. And so I just want to take a few minutes. Uh, last time I was speaking up here, um, we talked about kind of like the heavens, and we talked about the stars, and we talked about galaxies and the universe, and we talked about the sun. We talked about all these different things that God made with a word in Genesis chapter 1. He spoke one word, and he did this, like, ridiculous work. Like, there's billions upon billions upon billions of galaxies. There's one septillion stars. That's one with 24 zeros, and it says that he knows the name of every single one of those stars, and not one of them goes missing by his great power and divine majesty. And so you can look at the stars and you could see his divine, uh, his, his divine nature and eternal power. You could see who God is. You could see what he's like. What, you know, when he calls something good, that's what good on the scale of God is. At the end of each day in the creation week, he said it was good, it was good, it was good. And at the end of the creation week, on day, well, on day six, rather, when he creates man and woman, he says it was very good. And so, interestingly, you can actually look in biology and this wasn't really possible, you know, a few decades ago. Like, this is stuff that was kind of like, we, they were starting to figure out in like the 50s, and then the 60s they got some more, and then the 70s. But now in the last like 10, 20 years, now that we have way better microscopes and we've got way better ways to, you know, look and, and you know, could put different radioactive dyes and different things to really zoom in and hone in on specific areas at the micro level, you can see utterly fantastic things in every form of of living creature, every form of biology. Microbiology has shown so much of God's design, so much of God's sovereignty, so much of God's goodness. And so I just want to take a few minutes this morning and kind of just sample that for a few minutes. So um, the easiest way to do that, I feel like, is, um, you know, microbiology isn't exactly a topic that you're going to take on in a, you know, a 20-minute teaching and feel like, okay, I know microbiology now. Like, microbiology is something you get a PhD in and then study, study for the rest of your life, and you still have a lot to learn. And so the easiest way I could come up with to kind of give you this sampling um, in, in a, a snapshot time frame is to just read some quotes from some of these PhDs, some of these researchers, some of these professors that all they do is live and breathe and eat this stuff every single day of their lives. They write about it, they read about it, they talk about it, they study it, they research it, they conduct experiments. And so I just want to sample some of their, their writings and their statements concerning their work in microbiology. And so first, just kind of at a high level, um, one of the really, really cool things that they've, they've uncovered in the last few decades is nanomachines. And so nano is a word that deals with parts of one one billionth of a meter in that range. And so nanotechnology are molecular machines usually made of proteins that basically are operating like within cells, within bloodstreams, within all these different you know, microorganisms and micro parts of, of, of organisms. And they're, they're these machines that operate just like machinery here in the macro human size world. But they're doing this like phenomenal work. And so here, here's some of what they do. Um, molecular machines haul cargo from one place in the cell to another along highways made of other molecules, while still others act as cables, ropes, and pulleys to hold the cell in shape. Machines turn cellu cellular switches on and off, sometimes killing the cell or causing it to grow, depending on the need. Solar-powered machines capture the energy of photons and store it in chemicals. Electrical machines allow current to flow through nerves. Manufacturing machines build other molecular machines as well as themselves. 
nanomachines building nanomachines. It's, it's weird. It's like crazy. Um, think about the, you know, they're talking about photosynthesis, obviously. You think about plant cells, plants and le or cells and leaves. You're taking solar radiation at the nano level and converting it. In, you're converting it into usable energy and then storing it into a chemical that can be used by the plants, which then can be ingested by other creatures, which can then be used to, you know, ultimately fuel fossil fuels and then power an automobile. Like, basically the reason why we have energy that's usable on this planet is because there's nanotechnology in leaves that's converting solar energy into something useful. It's, it's crazy. If you think about like what that really means, like we, here we are 21st century, we're, we're super smart, we're really great, we have the internet, and we, ha we have PhDs, and we have all this great stuff. We've got universities, we've got institutions, we've got industries, multi-billion dollar industries that have you know, all this money and time and effort expended on the energy problem, and ultimately, what, we're working on solar panels and making that more practical. Work. Ultimately, on the nano level, God was doing this from day one. And that's how everything on Earth is, is really powered, for, for the most part, for the most part. Um, weather systems and what have you also kind of get powered by the sun, and that, that can help as well. But most of the useful energy ultimately comes from photosynthesis. God did that day one, nanotechnology, billions of a meter. It's happening on every single plant you've ever seen all the time. But not, not, you know, it doesn't think about it. It doesn't have to try. It just is. It does it because God spoke it and created it that way. So electrical nanomachines, they allow current to flow through nerves. Manufacturing machines build other molecular machines as well as themselves. Cells can swim using nanotechnology. They can copy themselves. They can duplicate themselves using nanomachines. Um, they can ingest food with nanotechnology. That will, and I'm calling it nanotechnology. When I use that word in this context, I mean God's design, like natural. This is, this is built right into creation. Using nanomachines, they can ingest food in short, Highly sophisticated molecular machines control every single cellular process on which life depends. And so, like, here's another interesting quote. Um, that, that, that summary was from uh, Dr. Michael Behe. He's a microbiologist at Lehigh University. He's been doing this for decades. Um, this next quote is from Dr. Michael Denton. Um, this, I think, I think um, Behe is some sort of believer of at least... Uh, creationism, or, you know, theology. I'm not sure specifically if it's Christianity or what, but he, he at least believes in intelligent design and, and what, whatnot. Um, this next quote is actually from a guy who considers himself to be an agnostic, but he sees so much design and so much complexity and so much in intelligence into the things he's studying in microbiology. He's definitely, he says some interesting things. So listen to this. To grasp the reality of life as it has been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell 1,000 million times until it is 20 kilometers in di diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. So basically he said, pretend you've got a cell. You've, ma you've magnified it 1,000 million times. So now it's like this like spaceship, airship thing that's hovering over New York City, Independence Day, whatever. And what we would then see what we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. On the surface of the cell, we would see millions of openings like the portholes of a vast spaceship, opening and closing to allow a continual stream of materials to flow in and out. If we were to enter one of these portholes, we would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. He's basically saying, like, look, the like, sci-fi stuff that we put in movies today that's what it's like on the nanoscale, just built into nature by God's design. Like, it's that complicated, it's that cool, it's that kind of just like out there and weird by our, you know, our human normal comprehension, everyday thinking. Um, the more they study microbiology, the more they find of these nano machines. Like, I think it was a few years ago, maybe it was 2006, they did a, a research project and they were studying yeast. And just in that research project with yeast alone from a few years ago, this is 21st century, they found 250 nanomachines that they'd never even seen before. Like, there, there are just so, there are so many of these machines built into Gaza's, and there's so many of them that the more they look, the more they find, the more they study the ones they already know about, the more complex, the more complicated, the more sophisticated they realize that they actually are. 
um, typically, the machines that occur, these nanomachines that occur naturally in, in microbiology, they're typically more efficient than their macro human-sized counterpart. So for instance, um, I'll, I'll go into this more in a bit, but they have um, a lot of cells, they have a flagellar motor, and that's basically this whip-like tail cord thing that allows a cell to swim. And so that motor is actually a rotary motor, and it's powered by a form of charged ions. It's, it's positive electricity instead of negative electricity. It's protons instead of electrons. But it's basically an electric rotary motor. And when they look at this electric rotary mo motor called a, a flagellar motor, that thing is way, way, way more efficient and way, way, way more capable than anything that man has created in the, the rotary motor field. Like, it's, it's, there's no comparison at all. It can, um, some of them can spin up to 100,000 RPMs. Um, my, my Honda, I think, red lines at 7,000 RPMs. And the reason, do you guys know why they put red lines on cars? So every, every car has a, a gas-powered rotary motor. Why, why do they have a red line? Why do they have that part in your tachometer where if, you go, if the needle goes past into the red, you're in trouble? What happens? Yeah, you're, you're, a good car, your engine will automatically turn off. But a bad car, it will probably explode, sure. But ultimately, um, ultimately what's going to happen is they're, they're protected. There's a system in place that the, the engineers have put, put in place where they're saying, look, this is as much speed, this is as much capacity as this engine can handle before it tears its, itself apart. This is it. And so if it reaches that red line zone, your engine is now in danger of just throwing, you know, just spinning into, you know, destruction. And so that's, we're talking like, you know, some cars are 6,000 RPMs, some cars, if you had a fancy sports car, you'll get 10,000 RPMs. These rotary motors on the nanotechnology level, or the nano uh, machine level, that every, you know, a lot of these cells have, 100,000 RPMs, some of them hit up. They can, um, while they're spinning, you know, going full speed, they can stop within a quarter turn and start going full speed the other way, like on a dime. Like, it's like this near instantaneous thing. It's, a, it's like switching gears. It's like going from first, gre first gear to reverse without, like, using brakes or doing anything like that meaningful mechanically. You're just like, oh, time to go the other way, and then it just starts spinning the other way. <laughs> um, some of these cells with a flagellar motor, they can go, um, they, can, they can propel the, the host cell at a rate of 15 cellular body lengths per second. So that probably doesn't mean anything, but if you can scale that up to a human size, so pretend that we, you know, we, we could take one of these guys and throw him in like a swimming pool, and he, you know, this one of these flagellar cells was human size. If we, it'd be like a human being going in like the ocean or an Olymp Olympic pool and just start swimming at 60 miles per hour. And meanwhile, while it's swimming at 60 miles per hour, it's only using 2% of its total energy capacity. So it's like it's not even like it's not even trying. It's, it, it's got so much leftover energy to just do its other stuff, process food, take care of things. The, the motor, these motors are hardwired into something that's called a transduction mechanism. And that's just a fancy word for saying it's sensing its environment all the time. So that the, the motor is sensing from this transduction mechanism, it knows where food is. And so the motor will start swimming towards food. And then it knows where toxins are, so it'll start swimming automatically. Away from, away from the toxins. And so you gotta, you, it's just like this ridiculous machine. Um, Dr. Dr. Howard Berg of Harvard University, he dubbed the flagellar motor the most efficient machine in the known universe. It operates at a near 100% energy efficiency. Um, Man-made rotors, ro rotary motors, um, some of them can actually hit up to close to 95%, which you're like, oh, 95%, that's not, that's not bad. You know, okay, we're not at 100, but 95 is not bad. But the, the trick here is if you try to scale those engines down, they don't work anymore. The only reason why they can achieve 95% is because friction, water adhes uh, adhesity, different properties of chemicals and different properties of, of physics, they're easy to achieve efficiency at the macro level. But at the micro level, the nano level, that type of efficiency, you know, and you also think about, okay, if you've got this big, huge honker of an engine made by a man, losing 5% of your energy all the time is a massive amount of energy just being dumped out the window. 
But if you're like this little, like microscopic, I need a thousand million times magnified just to think about it, like if you're this little nothing and you're losing almost 0% of your energy and you're dealing with all these, you know, the, the harder, harder physical properties with friction, you're dealing with the adhesive, the, uh, the greater adhesity of water at that level, you're dealing with all these things that are stacked against you and you're still operating at near 100% efficiency. That, it's fantastic. It's, fa it's, it's magnificent what God did. Um, the motor is made up of about 40 different protein components. If you take any one of them away, the whole thing just stops working. And so like, it's, it's, this, it's not just efficient in its throughput in its, en its use of energy, it's efficient in its design. It's, it, the very mechanics, the parts that are used, that, that comprise the motor, everything there is useful. Everything there is necessary. Everything there is essential. It's boiled down to this like quintessential, efficient, here's the design and it works. And there's not extra stuff going on that's unneeded. The parts include um, the equivalent, obviously, you know, not like God was necessarily using this terminology when he, he came up with it. But the human macro scale equivalent of the parts include a rotor, a stator, a clutch, a drive shaft, bushing, universal joint, O-ring, propeller, et cetera. Like, if you look at the way this thing's designed, like, so many of the concepts are things that a human engineer, you know, whatever, many, many years later came up with the same types of concepts. And so if you think about that for a second, like, wait a minute. God spoke that, Genesis chapter 1, then we designed stuff, you know, in the 20th century, and then we discovered it in the late 20th century, and, the 20, and the, we discovered the same concepts, the same designs in nanotechnology that was there, like, forever. It's crazy. Like, it shows, like, wow, like, we're, we're his children, and we're, we're, like, we're, we think like him, and the design, the, the intelligence that we use to engineer that motor it's the same type of intelligence that God used. I mean, God did it better, obviously, and did it first, but it's the same type of intelligence that God used to create the motor and the, and the nanotechnology, or the nanomachine level. It's, it's an awesome idea. All right, we'll do one more, and then we'll go back to, to Scripture. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Everybody knows what it is. It's what, what carries your genes, what carries you know, your chromosomes. This is what makes you look like mom and dad. This is what makes you you know, have certain physical characteristics and giftings and certain other propensities for maybe not good things. It depends. But DNA, that's, that's basically, here's our genetic makeup. Here's, here's our physical, biological makeup. And every single cell has got our DNA or, or, you know, an organism's DNA. And so studying DNA, knowing what we know about it now with these microbiologists, these PhDs, um, it's the most, if the flagellar motor is the most efficient machine, like engine in the known universe, DNA is the most efficient information storage technology in the no, known universe. Like, if you can think about, like, what do they have now? Like, micro SD cards, like, the kinds that are in, like, good smartphones, and there are these little tiny things that fit on the tip of your pinky, and if you have, like, an expensive one, you might be able to fit, like, 64 gigabytes or, you know, 128 gigabytes. I don't, I don't know. I was looking at Amazon last night. Most of them looked like they were, or they were 64 gigabytes if you wanted to spend money. And it's like, okay, 64 gigabytes on my pinky that's pretty cool. I, I can, that's like, I don't know, half a dozen HD movies on my, on my pinky. Two hour movies right there. I got the whole Star Wars series in HD on my pinky. And so you feel pretty cool about it. But then you got you to realize DNA, it's, if you can take one pinhead worth of DNA, it can store the equivalent of four million terabytes of data, which is, if I, if I just had half a dozen HD movies on my, on my pinky, this is 4 billion HD movies on a pinhead in DNA. Like, it's, it's just, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy awesome. It's crazy ridiculous how efficient, how well-designed, how well-orchestrated, how sophisticated this, this information storage technology is that God just spoke, and it just happened. Boom. Um, DNA can be read. It can be output as RNA. It can be replicated and self-repaired. Micro SD cards don't do any of that by themselves. <laughs> if you could take one teaspoon of DNA, you can store the genetic information of every species that ever existed, ever. 
And they're, they're estimating that that's like millions of species. And you're like, millions of species? We don't have, well, you're not thinking about microbiology. You're not thinking about all these single-celled organisms. You're not thinking about bacteria. You're not thinking about all these like funky little fungus, fungi and plant. You know, there's all this like crazy stuff that you can't even see that's just floating around. And there's all this extinct stuff too that we don't think about either. There's lots and lots and lots of species that could be stored in one teaspoon of DNA. And you still would have room left over in that teaspoon of DNA to store everything ever written down by man ever in history. So you say, Tim, why did you just spend 20 minutes talking about biker biology? Because God is awesome. And we don't, you don't think to glorify God for what he did in microbiology necessarily day to day. You don't think about this stuff because it's not obvious. To, you know, the invisible qualities of God, though, can be clearly seen by what has been made. Well, now that we have the technology, now that we have the microscopes, now that we have all these different uh, methodologies of study and all these different universities and institutions that are studying these things, and we have thousands and thousands of years of accumulated knowledge and, and, and insight, we can clearly see, wow, God, look at look what you did at the nano level. Look at what you did with nano machines from day one. Let's go to um, Isaiah chapter 45. For this, um, this is verse 18, for this is what the Lord says. Verse 18, Isaiah 45. This is what the Lord says. He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. But he did not create it to be empty. He formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret from somewhere in a land of darkness. I have not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. So here we are sitting in this awesome creation, one septillion stars, Independence Day, spaceship cells, 100,000 RPMs, flagellar motors, 4 billion HD movies on a pinhead. Here we are sitting in the creation. He says, look, I didn't create the universe to be empty. I created it to be inhabited. I didn't declare out of darkness for no reason. I spoke to my people, and what I said is true and right. We're back to, well, what's God's purpose? What's his plan? Why did he, why did he spin all of this into existence? Why did he do the Genesis 1, you know, creation week? Why did he go out of his way to make such a marvelous, magnificent creation so that we could occupy it, so that we can, we can be his redeemed offspring, his redeemed children, his, his redeemed likeness and image living for him and with him forevermore? You know, and I think about, um, I think about John chapter 2, and I'll paraphrase that one so we don't have to spend time flipping there right now. But John chapter 2 is, that's where Jesus does his first public miracle. And if you guys remember the story, it, they're at a wedding, him and his, his, his mother, him and Mary, and they're just kind of hanging out, minding their own business. And Jesus didn't look like he was necessarily like, getting ready to break out the, the divine, supernatural, miraculous. He kind of was just hanging out at the wedding. And, they, you know, eventually they go to, like, the, the master of ceremony, and the servants are like, hey, buddy, we are out of wine, and the wedding is not yet really that far along. So that's kind of a bummer. And then so Mary kind of overhears that and says, hey, just, um, just do me a favor and listen do whatever, um, whatever my son says, whatever Jesus says, just do it, and this is going to be taken care of for you. And if you, re if you look at kind of what happens, it really appears as though Jesus has little to no intention of doing something supernatural in that moment. But Mary's faith, Mary's excitement at the promises of God, if you think about Mary's position, how she's, she's been carrying this promise for 30 plus years of, hey, I, you know, I was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. I, w I was immaculate conception, conceived this Christ child, and now I've been ra I've raised this child into an adult. He's a man. He's 30 years old. I've been hanging out with him. Like, 
I'm ready for God to work through him, like, publicly now. And it's not that she was, like, doubting him or doubting God's purpose, but it was, like, 30 years of watching your, your Christ child grow up and live his life as a carpenter. It's got to be a little bit, you know, nail-biting. I'm re- you know, like, there's some anticipation. Like, and so Mary's like, all right, just do what he says. For, for, for the love of God, do what he says. Like, I want, I want to see the miraculous. I want to see my, my son start moving in, in the assignment, start moving in the calling, in the election that he has. And so, like, I think about that. And I wonder, would Jesus have turned... 88 gallons of water into the best wine that they had ever tasted, if not for Mary's activity, Mary's part in it. I'm not saying Jesus wouldn't have done miracles and made a public display and, and kicked off his, you know, his public miraculous miracle ministry. I, I, I'm not saying he wouldn't have done that anyways. But the way it transpired, Mary played such a crucial role in causing things to unfold the way they did. She played such an active part in causing that kingdom, kingdom of God growing step on that journey to take place. And I think it's, it's very much indicative of the same type of thing that God expects from us now. Like, here we are. We're in this ridiculous creation. We have this awesome, too good to be true, almost, news called the gospel of Jesus Christ, our salvation. Our sins are taken care of. We're we're seated in heavenly places. Everything is kind of just every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm is ours in Christ Jesus. All the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. Like, we're kind of sitting on top of this mountain of, like, Scrooge McDuck pile of money. You know, it's not about, don't make it about money. I'm just, I'm trying to make a picture, though. We're on a mountain of blessing. And God's now saying, like, okay, let's use some action now. Like, part of God's sovereignty was delegating faith into the earth, delegating the response of his children into the earth, delegating the, the, you know, he calls it the body of Christ. He calls his people, his church, the body of Christ. So he's delegated the action, the activity. Now you're, you're, you're Scrooge McDuck. You're sitting in that salvation. You're sitting in that awesome creation. And now it's time to start doing something through him and with him and for him by faith, saying, okay, God, here's your word. Here's your plan. Here's your purpose. You said you're a healer. You said that by his stripes I'm healed. You said that I can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Well, I'm going to do that in Jesus' name. You said that prayer will move mountains. You said that prayer will change the course of the day. Well, then I am going to, by God, pray. I'm going to go into my prayer closet. I'm going to make time with my Lord. I'm going to do what's, what needs to be done in secret so that what needs to be done openly can be done. I'm going to do the purposes of my God. I'm going to do the will of my God. I'm going to love on him properly. You said that you will step out on the praises of your people, so I am going to praise you out loud, unashamed. I'm going to give you glory because you deserve to be glorified. I'm going to tell you that you are good because you are. I mean, So basically, all I'm really trying to say is that, yeah, God is really powerful. And yeah, God is really sovereign and standalone, sufficient, divine, supreme, unstoppable, unbeatable, immovable. But that unstoppable, unbeatable, immovable God has got a plan that involves you. And our an us an action, and it, it it involves a response. It involves it involves us saying yes and making a move. It invo- faith is always that two step process where you believe in your heart and then you take action. Faith without works is no faith at all. It's dead. The book of James says. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that's the type of faith that saves you. If you just believe in your heart, that doesn't do anything. Unfortunately. It's the belief in your heart with the execution, the action, the, the, the actuation of that belief by doing something, by speaking it, by going out and saying, okay, well, I'm going to be the one to stand up and say what's true. I'm going to be the one to lay hands on that person. I'm going to be the one to rebuke that demonic activity right there. I'm going to be the one. And so that's what the call of God is for, the, for, for his children. That's what the call of God is for mankind. So I just invite you, why don't, you, why don't we all stand up? 
I'll, I'm going to close out the meeting in a second here. Yes, keyboard would be excellent. If that's you, though, and you're like, huh, I heard what the teacher was saying. I heard, I heard the purpose of God this morning, and I know I'm not moving in it. I know that the call of God on my life is not happening. Maybe you don't know Christ at all. Maybe you, you've never knew him. Maybe you, you knew him yesteryear, but you feel like you've lost your way. Maybe you're a Christian, but you feel like you're just immobile and ineffective and unresponsive. Maybe you've been at church for your whole life, and you're, it's, time, it's, it's time to actually get serious and make a move. Whatever the case may, may be, whether brand new entrance into the kingdom, renewal, recommitment, or it's time to be actuated and activated in the kingdom of God, I just want to make room for that today. I want to make room for there to be a statement, a statement of response. I want to make room for there to be opportunity to get prayed for, for those things. And so I just invite, I invite everybody, just bow your heads, close your eyes for a second. Is that you? If you've never known God before, if you've never had Christ in your life, I just invite you, while everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed, nobody's really looking except for me and God. If you want to, be, if you want to receive Christ, if you want to have God in your life, if you want to enter into the family, the kingdom of God, I just invite you to slip up your hand for a second here so I can see it. Yep, I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Now I ask, maybe maybe you knew Christ at one point, but you've just gone by the wayside. You backslid, you whatever it may be, you lost track, you lost course, your your compass got you pointing in the wrong direction, and now you don't know where you are and you don't even know if you really got Christ on board the way you want him. If that's you and you just need to recommit and redevote, I invite you to raise up your hand for a second. Yep, I see that hand. I just invite um, the people that responded to those two calls to come up front with me. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to lead you in prayer. I'm going to help you invite God into your life properly. And so I just invite, I think there was four or, four or five of you that raised your hand. If you can be so bold as to come up front, something supernatural can and will happen. And it takes, this, this, is, this is it. This is the step of faith. This is the step of faith. We just talked about how it takes a response from the heart of man. That God is sovereign, but in his sovereignty, he's asked for a response from his children. This is the response. Let there be no mistake. And I know know we're in America right now, and I know this is uncomfortable. Oh, man, I had to go up in front of people. I, I know the feeling. It's a bummer. But... God's purpose, his salvation, his life, his blessing, his favor, operating your your purpose and destiny, your calling, operating wholesale in your life properly in God, it's worth the bummer. It's worth it. Also, I'm... can I, get a, can I get a couple of the leaders up here as well to help me pray? If you're in that third group, maybe a few leaders can just kind of migrate over here. If you're in that third group where you're like, all right, I'm in Christ, I've been in Christ, I've been in church, never lost track, never lost sight, but I just don't feel like I'm firing on all cylinders. I don't feel like I'm 
affected and actuated and activated properly in Christ. I'm not, I'm just not hitting my stride in Christ yet for whatever reason. Maybe you know the reason, maybe you don't. I just invite you to let some of the leaders minister to you. Let, you know, come up front. Let, if you've got a specific need or a specific area of concern, if there's something that you feel has blocked you or whatever it may be, or maybe you have no idea what it is, just let the leaders of the house bless you. Let them touch you. Let them pray over you. Let them deliver you into a proper, fruitful relationship with God. And so that's available right there as well. I'm just going to lead you guys up. I'm going to lead you guys in prayer that are receiving Christ. Father God, we just invite you into our lives. We want to know you. We want to touch you. We want to know your salvation in Christ. We acknowledge what Jesus did on the cross for our sins. We acknowledge that he was crucified and resurrected so that our sins could not be ever counted against us again. And right now, based on that, we invite Christ into our lives. We receive our salvation. We receive the forgiveness of sin. We receive the hope of God today. This day, we receive the hope of God into our lives. Father, we're asking you to keep us, secure us, help us, teach us along the way, and we commit ourselves to you in your son Jesus' name. Amen.